I'm LT, and thanks for watching Truck Tech. Now, whether we're out on the trail or working in the shop, you're not going to want to miss a single episode. So all you got to do is hit that subscribe button. Today on Truck Tech, we add a little bit of mid-90s flair to this early 2000s GMC. I might be crazy, but I just think it might work. about popular trends for a moment. Now, I'm not talking about fashion, shoes, jeans, any of that. I mean, obviously, you guys have seen how I dress. I am not up on the most current fashion trends. Well, let's talk about trucks. If you go to a popular truck show, maybe SEMA or something like that today, you look around, you're gonna see bigger, badder. Everything is giant. Wheels, 24, 26 inches. It's kind of almost the standard nowadays. You know, lift kits, you've got nine inches, 14 inches, sometimes on air ride. Just, it's all about being big, being outlandish. Now let's talk about old school trucks for a second. Let me take you back. This is kind of to when I was in middle school and high school in the mid 90s. If you had a big tire, well guess what? You were rolling on 33, 12, 50, 15s. You know, I'm talking roll bar in the bed with the yellow lights on top. Those are some things that were way cool back in the day. But as trends do, they come and then they go. So it's been a long time since I've seen a truck that's had a roll bar bolted in the back. Now I will note that it is becoming popular again because that's another thing that happens with trends. They're cyclical, they come and they go. In fact, if you browse social media, one thing I've noticed, you see a lot of small wheels that are coming back into play. You know, it's now all of a sudden cool again to be running like a 16 by 12 old school wheel. It's time for a new project here at Truck Tech. In fact, I'm sitting in it right now. So let me show you what I picked out. Now, I suppose the logical choice for a mid 90s throwback build would be a mid 90s truck, but we've seen that before. I wanted to see the mid 90s treatment on an early 2000s truck, and that's why I picked a 2002 GMC Sierra 1500. Now, this is probably one of the most popular used trucks on the market to this day. They made literally millions of these things, and ours has 250,000 miles on it, but that's okay because it runs great. Now, as far as the condition it's in, this is about as original as they come. The three most popular modifications, wheels, exhaust, and intake, all bone stock. So this truck is basically a time capsule. The interior, considering its age, is in really great shape, so this is a perfect blank canvas to start our retro build. Now, as far as my initial impressions of this particular truck, it's a classic GMC, and it drives, I mean, basically like a nearly 20-year-old truck should drive. It's got a few clunks in the front end, definitely a few loose parts here and there. So we'll address that along the way. But as far as power goes, I mean, these little 5.3s, they actually do really well. They're reliable. I mean, they'll last forever. And it's pretty spunky for being a stock truck with 258,000 miles on the odometer. So we'll rebuild the front end. We'll tighten things up there, get rid of some of the looseness, some of the play. That's fairly basic standard operating procedure when you drive a truck that's nearly 20 years old. Take care of some of the problems and we'll give this truck a new lease on life. So let's get back to the shop, let's get started. When I originally came up with a scheme to put our roll bar in the bed of this pickup, I wasn't actually sure if I could even find one new. I figured worst case scenario, either I had to go to a junkyard, find an old one and get it either replated or repainted, or I would just build one out of stainless steel exhaust tubing. But luckily they actually still make them, so we picked one up. Now we did get it from Summit Racing because they have such an extensive line of truck accessories, and this is a Go Rhino bed bar. Now they make this in black or chrome, which for me is the obvious choice if we're doing a mid-90s style of build. And it's a double single. 
Basically what that means, there are two main bars and a pair of kickers that go down the back. Now this is designed to resemble an off-road full roll cage, but it's just a stylistic upgrade. There's actually no collision or rollover protection that this will afford you, but it looks great and I can't wait to get it in. Later on, we'll show you how to extract a broken bolt without damaging your cylinder head. But up next, nothing says throwback like retro lighting. We're adding a little mid-90s throwback styling to our extended cab GMC with this chrome bed bar and is very simple to assemble. The tubes are sleeved so they can slide together and a series of bolts hold it all in place. With the main double tubes connected with a spacer in between and everything tightened down, we get the whole thing into the bed of the Sierra. All right, Jimmy, so we're going for a bit of a retro vibe here. What do you think? Did we nail it? Uh, yes, I think you did. It screams 90s. Okay, good. I was gonna say, some people, some people think a little bit 80s or even 70s with a roll bar, but no, I this think is you... what I remember. Oh, you're on the little tow hook. There, there we go. go. I think you hit the nail on the head with this one. I like it. All right, man, well, I'm gonna let you get back to it. I can't wait to see till this thing's done because <laughs> this is a pretty good start. You know what, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I don't care, I like it. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks. Because this is a universal roll bar kit, all we've got to do is get it centered in the bed and slid all the way forward, and then we can mark for placement of the holes. All right, we're drilling holes through the bed. So you gotta pay attention to where stuff is. In this particular truck, there's a gas tank that runs right along here. This is a really long drill bit. Now, you just can be careful, you shouldn't have any problems. But if you jam this thing all the way through, you might smell gas that starts to leak. So, just kinda take your time, and you'll be all set. Simply bolting this chrome roll bar into the bed of our GMC makes it look three or four years older than it really is. But we can do better than that and backdate this truck all the way to the mid 90s with the proper choice of lighting. Now, if you're gonna go get some off-road lights for your vehicle today, you're probably gonna grab an LED light bar. They're fairly short, often wide, and they put out a ton of light, but they're very expensive and just would not look at home on our build. There's really only one choice. And that is a set of four KC Daylighters. Now, you've seen these things before. Probably the most iconic vehicle they're on is Bigfoot. But this is definitely a mid-90s statement. They're really bright. They come with these yellow plastic covers, which are intended to make them legal for driving on the street. Because in a lot of jurisdictions, you actually can't have aftermarket lighting. So that's what the smiley face is for. And it makes me pretty happy too. So all we've got to do now is get this bolted to the light mounting bar and then we'll get everything bolted up to the roll bar. The light bracket is an optional extra, but it comes with the mounting holes pre-drilled, which makes installation of the lights a breeze. And the whole assembly can be attached to the roll bar with two bolts. Well, that is definitely Chuck Norris approved. While cosmetic upgrades are fine, it's time that we move on and install something that's actually gonna increase the performance of this truck. Because after all, something that looks good but is slow, it doesn't do anybody any good. Now, headers have been a popular modification for many years because they increase the performance of your engine by reducing the back pressure in the exhaust and increasing the scavenging effect, which essentially helps suck the exhaust out of the engine. Now, Summit Racing sells many different styles of header from a direct bolt-in shorty to a mid-length to this, a long tube header. Now, these generally take a few more steps to install, but the longer primaries will help increase the scavenging effect and a long tube usually has the greatest gains in horsepower out of any of the three styles that we listed. Now, this is also a ceramic coated header, which means it's gonna look this good pretty much the lifetime of the truck, but also it's gonna help contain some of the heat inside the exhaust system rather than letting it radiate out to the engine bay. Now, before I get these things installed, first I have to remove the manifolds and the rest of the exhaust system. Okay. 
When it comes time to disconnect the exhaust system from the manifolds, I usually shy away from using a breaker bar or a ratchet because in my experience, the slow twisting motion that you get is much more likely to twist off the rusted bolts. Instead, I prefer to use something with just a little bit more oomph, like the Matco Tools Half Inch Infinium Cordless 20 Volt Impact. And this has 1,600 pounds of breakaway torque from its brushless motor, but it also has a variable speed trigger, which works for the delicate jobs as well as the heavy duty stuff. It's got a nylon reinforced composite handle, which means it's durable and lightweight, and it has a five amp hour battery with a built-in charge indicator, which lets you know exactly how much juice you've got left. There we go. Gotcha. Next, long tube headers will make our 5.3 breed. It's a fact of life that engines can wear out. However, some are more prone to failure than others, like the 3.8 V6 found in JK Wranglers between 07 and 11. Now, if yours has been in the dust, you could take it apart and send it off to a machine shop to get it rebuilt. But a quicker and usually more affordable option would be to pick up a remanufactured long block from Powertrain Products. It comes with graphite coated pistons, which will reduce cylinder bore wear, long lasting multi layer steel head gaskets, Viton valve stem seals, which will reduce the oil consumption problem that these are known for, and it even comes with an updated oil pump. Standard, you'll get a five year warranty, but that can be extended all the way out to seven. So if you need a long block for your JK or pretty much any vehicle, check out Powertrain Products. Today, the name of the game is getting a set of long tubes installed on our O2 GMC. And I've already got the passenger side exhaust manifold off. Now you can see these things certainly aren't the best looking and they are slightly restrictive, but here's a cool tech tip. If you guys are doing an LS swap or something with a turbo application, these exhaust manifolds, well, they're actually made from cast steel and not cast iron, which is useful because you can cut off these three bolt flanges and weld on a V-band or weld on a different shaped outlet to this exhaust manifold, for, like I said, a turbo application or what have you. But anyway, we got to get the driver's side exhaust manifold off of the engine. And I already just took a peek and there's a broken off bolt on the very front port. Now this is actually a little bit common on an LS application, especially in a pickup truck or a vehicle that's seen higher miles and a lot of heat cycles. Basically, as that fastener expands and contracts, as it gets warmer and cooler, it can fatigue and just crack and basically the heads will fall off. Like I said, it's a fairly common problem and I'll show you how to deal with it. But first, we gotta get this manifold off the engine. I've seen guys try to fix these bolts, drilling them out, tapping them with like an easy out type situation. I've done that and it'll work, but it's time consuming and this is a little bit easier. Our 40 MIG welder is the ideal tool for the job since it can quickly build up material and get down into some harder reach places. I'll throw on some vice grips and the broken bolt quickly backs out. Well, all it took is one little glob welded on the end and we're able to back the bolt out. Now this works especially well on this situation, an aluminum cylinder head with an exhaust manifold bolt because the heat from welding actually helps soften up the thread locker that holds these in. And they're really not all that tight in the first place. You just need a way to kind of grab on and to back them out. So it's just one more way you can use a welder around the shop. Because the long tube headers are so much, well, longer than the stock exhaust manifolds, there's no way that they're going to easily connect to the factory mid pipe. So I cut off the excess and basically left this Y transition to merge two pipes into one. 
In the future, I do plan on running an aftermarket exhaust that bolts up to this flange right here. So for now, I'm just gonna leave the stock exhaust out back and this will just serve as a mounting location to hold everything in place while I fab up the middle section. The collectors have a three inch outlet and the Y pipe has a two and a half inch inlet and there's really no need to run three inch exhaust on an engine of this power level. So I'm gonna reduce down to two and a half inches right off the headers and on the driver's side, just make a quick 90 degree bend and it should shoot straight into the Y pipe. The passenger side should be even simpler because it's more or less a straight shot. I might need to jog it over to the left just a little bit, but it should be pretty simple. So I'll get started over here and I need about six or seven inches of pipe. My method for building a custom exhaust may seem a little bit unorthodox, but it works out pretty well for me. This is basically a game of connect the dots, and once the major components are mounted, all you've gotta do is fill in the gaps. I like to build small sub-assemblies at a time. Basically, I'll hold up one or two or possibly three bends at a time, mark for position, and then tack weld everything together over on the bench. Then I'll MIG tack the big chunks together underneath the truck so I know it's all gonna fit perfectly and then remove the entire thing for finish welding over on the bench. And we'll take care of that next. And we'll demo a MIG, TIG, and stick welder combination perfect for the do-it-yourselfer. It can be a little bit difficult to find a tire that'll work excellent off-road, but one that's also quiet enough to be driven comfortably when you're on the road. But the Grabber X3 from General Tire will do just that. It features a high void tread pattern with alternating shoulder lugs and multiple gripping edges, which will give you great traction in all kinds of terrain, sand, rocks, mud, or even just loose gravel. And the lugs on the sidewall, they'll provide extra protection and traction for when things get a little bit deep. The rubber compound will provide protection against cuts and gouges, and they're available in a wide range of sizes. Wheels between 15 to 22 inches, and the overall diameter goes up to 37. The Y-pipe that we're building for our GMC Sierra is made from stainless steel, as is the factory exhaust that we're connecting to. Now you can weld this together with a MIG welder. In fact, that's how I tacked these two joints with everything underneath the truck. But for finish welding, really the only method that I prefer with stainless steel is TIG welding. Now, if you have a small shop at your house or you have a professional fab shop and you weld both regular steel and aluminum, well, you're gonna need a TIG machine that'll handle both AC and DC output. And the Forney 220 AC-DC TIG is just the machine for you. Now, as its name suggests, it'll output up to 220 amps of power when it's plugged into 240 volts. However, this is an inverter-based dual voltage machine, and you can also plug it into 120 volts for those smaller projects, and if you just don't happen to have 240 volts of power at your shop. Now, this will output AC current with independent adjustment of both the balance and the frequency, and of course, it'll weld in the DC TIG mode as well, which is what we're gonna be using. But you can also use this as a stick machine. It's super versatile, but for our project, I need to set it up with a DC TIG mode at somewhere around 80 amps. If you're unfamiliar with the TIG welding process, it might seem a little bit complicated compared to MIG welding. And yes, it does require a few more steps, but it's really not all that bad. You wanna start out by setting your machine to the amperage that you'll need. And the rule of thumb is roughly one amp per thousandths of inch of thickness of material. Now I'm running 80 amps for the stainless exhaust tube, but that doesn't mean I'm using 80 amps all the time because the foot pedal, basically you can think of that like the throttle in your car. It controls how much power is being output. Now you don't wanna just floorboard this thing and hold it down because you're gonna melt a big giant hole in your material then you've got more work to do to try to patch it back up. Instead, you use the foot pedal, like I said, just like a throttle. You're gonna modulate how much power the machine is outputting. And from there, you're just gonna kinda go ahead and add a little dab of filler, move your torch, add a dab, and move your torch. Now, let's say you want a TIG weld kind of out of position. Maybe you need to do a roll cage or something where you're welding overhead, or you can't get your foot in a comfortable spot on a pedal. Now, Forney also sells this amp troll package along with their 220 AC-DC TIG, and it does away with the need for a foot pedal because it basically puts it on the torch here. You've got an on-off switch that 
turns the machine on and off. And then you've got a little rotary dial here that lets you ramp up and ramp down your current. So basically, you've got a foot pedal in your hand. Now, as far as our exhaust project goes, well, all I've got to do is patch up these last couple seams and we can get it back underneath the truck. Overall, that header install actually went fairly smoothly. Yes, we did have a few roadblocks along the way, like having to extract a few bolts from the cylinder head and modify the Y pipe. But honestly, that's just par for the course when it comes to building trucks, especially if you start with an older one. Now, my favorite part about this install is the fact that it uses the factory flange back here. So if we want to run the stock exhaust for a nice, quiet, kind of sleeper sound, we can do that. Or if we want to swap to an aftermarket dual exhaust for a little more rumble, well, that'll be super simple as well. So now the only thing we've got left to do is get this truck on the ground, start it up, check for leaks, and hear how it sounds. Well, it's nice and quiet, which means there are no leaks. Now, we're gonna fix that next time by adding an aftermarket exhaust, and we're definitely gonna give this thing a little bit more rumble, along with a few other upgrades that'll make this truck sit up in the air just a little bit and have a little more scoot when you put your right foot down. If you've got any questions about anything you've seen on the show today, be sure to check us out at PowerNationTV.com.